Hello, and welcome to this orthopaedics podcast on back pain. Back pain arising from the vertebral column is something that's commonly seen by physicians in a number of specialties. Causes of musculoskeletal back pain are often benign, but there are certain situations where the back pain may have a more sinister origin. During this podcast, we'll start by reminding ourselves of some general anatomy of the spine. We'll then look at some of the sinister causes of back pain in more detail before briefly discussing the less serious pathologies that can affect the spine. So let's start by taking a look at the key anatomy of the spine that you need to know and understand. There are three main functions of the vertebral column. To protect the spinal cord, to act as a site of attachment for muscles and ribs, and to transmit the weight of the trunk to the lower limbs. The vertebral column consists of 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, 5 lumbar vertebrae, and 4 coccygeal vertebrae. The big round part at the front is called the vertebral body. The two bony prongs that stick up bilaterally are the transverse processes, And finally, the bony prong sticking out posteriorly is called the spinous process, and that's the part that you're able to palpate when you're doing a spinal examination. The circular hole in the middle of the bone is called the vertebral foramen, and this is the part that transmits the spinal cord. Intervertebral discs live between each of the vertebrae, except in the cases of the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae, because the bones here are fused together. Here we can see a cross-section of an intervertebral disc. The discs consist of an outer fibrous part called the annulus fibrosus and an inner jelly-like part called the nucleus pulposus. The spinal cord, which is the bit that sits in the spinal canal, begins at the foramen magnum and ends at around L1 to L2. Because the spinal cord ends before the vertebral column has ended, the nerve roots that normally come out of L3 to S5 are very long. The collection of long nerve roots found at the bottom of the spinal cord are collectively known as the corda equina. A fully assembled vertebral column has a few curves in its shape. There is a concave shape to the cervical and lumbar regions of the spine, known as a lordosis, and there is a convex shape to the thoracic region, known as a kyphosis. These natural curves can become exaggerated or lost in certain pathologies, so it's useful to look for them when you examine the patient. Finally, let's consider a bit of crucial surface anatomy. T3 is at the level of the medial part of the spine of the scapula. T7 is at the inferior angle of the scapula. L4 is at the highest point of the iliac crest. S2 is at the level of posterior superior iliac spine. And furthermore, remember that C7 is very easily localized as it's a prominence at the lower part of the neck. Okay, so that's enough about spinal anatomy. Let's now have a look at some of the sinister pathologies that can affect the vertebral column. Back pain is considered to be sinister if it's caused by any of the following. Spinal cord compression, or cord equina syndrome, vertebral fracture, infection or malignancy. Symptoms or features in the patient's history that can make you suspect any of the above conditions are called red flags and these are really important to remember. Now let's have a look at each of these sinister causes of back pain in a bit more detail. The spinal cord or the corda equina can become compressed by a tumour, a vertebral fracture, or from intervertebral disc herniation. In the case of spinal cord compression, patients usually have back pain at the level of the lesion. In addition, they tend to have lower motor neuron symptoms at the level of the lesion, as well as upper motor neuron symptoms below the level of the lesion. In the case of corda equina compression, in addition to back pain, there may be bilateral sciatica, saddle anaesthesia, and weakness of the legs.
Patients experience urinary retention and faecal incontinence if the S2, S4 nerve roots are involved. This is because these nerve roots normally cause contraction of the detrusor muscle, relaxation of the external bladder sphincter, and contraction of the anal sphincter via the parasympathetic nervous system. If the compression is left for long enough, the patient's urinary retention may develop into irreversible overflow incontinence. So it's really important that if cordae equina syndrome is suspected, you refer the patient urgently to a spinal surgeon for decompression. Unless there is a history of significant trauma, vertebral fractures usually occur in bones that are pathologically weakened, such as those which are osteoporotic or those which are riddled with metastases. The fractures are usually crushing and occur in the anterior part of the vertebral body, making the bone look wedge-shaped. Patients often complain of back pain that is worse on standing, and they may have noticed some loss of height or kyphosis too. On examination, palpation of the fractured vertebra elicits tenderness. Fractured vertebra are best seen on MRI. Your management of the patient will depend on what the cause of the fracture was. If the cause was high energy trauma, management of the patient should take an A, B, C, D, E approach, as there are probably lots of other coexisting existing injuries that we'll need dealing with too. If the cause was low energy trauma on a background of underlying bone disease, then it's the underlying bone disease that should be managed in order to prevent any further fractures from occurring. So for example, if the fracture occurred in a patient with severe osteoporosis, you might want to encourage them to do more exercise, stop smoking, take calcium supplements, and perhaps bisphosphonates. Infections of the vertebrae are pretty uncommon. Any kind of septicemia can potentially lead to it though. So if a patient's had any recent dental work, pneumonias, UTIs, or is generally immunocompromised, then it's worth bearing in mind as a potential differential if they present with back pain. The back pain associated with the vertebral infections is usually well localised. Palpation over the affected vertebrae makes the pain worse. If the infection is particularly bad, the vertebral body might begin to erode away, leading to vertebral fracturing and subsequent kyphosis. The patient is likely to be systemically unwell too, with a fever and perhaps a tachycardia. Investigations into a suspected spinal infection might include simple blood tests, in which there may be a raised ESR, raised CRP, or positive blood culture. Mantoux testing, which would be positive if the causative bug was mycobacterium tuberculosis. Sputum cultures or urine dipsticks, which might help you to identify the original source of septicemia. An x-ray of the vertebrae, though it should be noted that any x-ray changes that are consistent with a spinal infection don't really become visible till around four to eight weeks after the symptoms have started. If you were to do an x-ray quite late though, you'd expect to see disc space narrowing and maybe pathological fractures. Vertebral infections are best treated with antibiotics to which the causative bug is sensitive. The vertebral body can be affected by primary hematological malignancies or secondary metastases from elsewhere. 90% of malignancies in the spine present with back pain which is often described as focal, constant and unremitting. Because the cancer may be a secondary metastasis, the patient may also have symptoms relating to the primary, for example rectal bleeding and abdominal pain if the primary is in the bowel, or hemoptysis if the primary is in the lung. The patient may also have some of the more general symptoms of cancer, such as weight loss, loss of appetite and cachexia. You will need to tailor your investigations to the investigation of such a patient and it's always advisable to use a system, but we're not going to go through this here. In a patient who has malignancy of the vertebral column, one of the main complications you should be worried about is spinal compression. You should therefore manage the patient with high-dose corticosteroids and radiotherapy to try and remove as much of the malignancy as possible before it has had the chance to start squashing the spinal cord. Bisphosphonates may also be given to reduce bone resorption and manage bony pain. And for the actual cancer side of things, the patient should of course be managed with an MDT approach. So now we're going to talk about conditions affecting the spine that are not considered serious enough to need urgent management. The sort of things we're talking about here are mechanical back pain, disc prolapse without spinal cord compression, 
spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and ankylosing spondylitis. So let's briefly look at each of these conditions. Mechanical back pain is where you have back pain that's simply due to overuse of a normal structure, such as a muscle in the back. Mechanical back pain is typically in the lower back. It tends to be worse on movement and is typically relieved by rest. On examination of the patient, you may see a loss of the normal lumbar lordosis, which is a result of spasming of the injured muscles in this area. And on palpation of the paraspinal muscles, there may also be tenderness. In terms of investigations, there aren't really any that you would do if you were suspecting mechanical back pain. The diagnosis is usually made on the basis of the history and the examination. Management of the patient should involve good analgesia and plenty of encouragement for the patient to keep active despite their pain. This is because prolonged bed rest has been shown to worsen the patient's prognosis. If there's a tear in the annulus of the intervertebral disc, it may lead to herniation of the nucleus pulposus. Patients normally give a history of leaning forwards, hearing a popping sound in their back, and developing back pain shortly afterwards. The usual disc involved is the one that lies between S5 to S1. Depending on the severity of the herniation, there's a small chance that the patient may develop spinal cord compression or corda equina syndrome. So it's important to ask about the relevant red flag symptoms to rule out these conditions. If the patient doesn't have any red flags, the chances are that the herniated nucleus pulposus is simply irritating one of the nerve roots making up the synaptic nerve. As a result, the patient will probably have pain in the distribution of the sciatic nerve, i.e. along the back of the thigh and down the back of the calf. And on examination, the straight leg raising test is usually positive. Most patients with a disc prolapse are diagnosed clinically. If you really want to confirm the diagnosis radiologically, you'll need to do an MRI of the spine. And this is an example of an MRI that shows a disc prolapse. With time, disc prolapses usually heal themselves. Management of the patient should include intensive physiotherapy, keeping active in spite of pain, and taking adequate analgesia. If the problem reoccurs very often or doesn't seem to be healing by itself, you could try a surgical option such as removing the herniated disc, i.e. doing a discectomy, and then fusing the vertebra either side of it, which is known as spondylodesis. In the condition of spinal stenosis, you have a decrease in the diameter of the spinal canal, or the intervertebral foramina through which nerve roots arise. This could be the result of a number of conditions, including spondylolisthesis, which we'll look at next, osteoarthritis of the spine, disc prolapse, or Paget's disease. Typically, patients describe lower back pain that's been getting progressively worse over time, as well as pain in the legs that is brought on by exercise and relieved by sitting down or leaning forward. This feeling of pain that's relieved by sitting or leaning forward is known as neurogenic claudication. The mechanism behind why this occurs is quite interesting and worth learning in case you're asked in a viva situation. Essentially, in spinal stenosis, the narrowing of the spinal canal means that the veins supplying the spinal cord get squashed slightly, so the venous return through them is impeded and you get venous congestion. If the patient does any exercise, venous return from their legs increases, and as a result, the blood flow through the spinal cord veins increases too. The venous congestion therefore gets worse. The veins dilate more and they squash the underlying nerve roots, resulting in the patient getting more leg pain. When the patient stops exercising, venous return from the legs decreases, so the spinal cord veins become less congested and less dilated. As a result, the pressure is relieved and the leg pain subsides. In terms of investigations that you do, if you suspect that a patient had spinal stenosis, you'd probably be thinking of either an MRI or a CT scan, as these would show up the narrowed spinal canal or intervertebral foramina. Management of the patient is largely symptomatic. You might want to refer the patient for physiotherapy so that they can learn best how to move their back without getting pain, or you could try the patient with analgesics such as NSAIDs or weak opiates such as codamol or codigamol. If the pain is severe and cannot be controlled using these methods alone, you could refer the patient to a spinal surgeon 
for surgical management. Spondylolisthesis is where one of the vertebra slips forward relative to the one that normally sits on top of it. The L5 vertebra is the one that's most commonly involved. Patients may complain of lower back pain that's worse on standing. The pain may also radiate to their buttocks. On examination, you might see an increase in the normal lumbar lordosis, and on palpation of the spine, you may be able to feel a displacement of the affected vertebra. To help diagnose spondylolisthesis, you should do a lateral plane x-ray of the spine. A spinal MRI or CT would also be useful in helping you to determine the extent of spinal cord narrowing. Patients with this condition should be managed in the same way as they would be for spinal stenosis. It's important to note that if the patient develops any symptoms of cordae equina syndrome though, such as central anesthesia or urinary retention, they should be managed in the way that was outlined for this earlier. Ankylosing spondylitis is a seronegative arthropathy that affects the spine and sacroiliac joints. It's covered in quite a lot of detail in some of our other arthropathies podcasts, so we're not going to go into it here. In terms of the benign conditions that affect the spine, we've already mentioned that it's important with all of these to rule out red flags that may point to a more serious pathology. However, there's also a concept of yellow flags. These are a set of risk factors that determine a poorer prognosis for the patient in terms of rehabilitation. These include wrong beliefs about the nature of their pain, adoption of the sick role, false treatment expectations, and coexistent psychological and other social factors. So in summary, in this podcast, we looked at the basic anatomy of the spine that you need to understand in order to correctly examine and take a history from a patient as well as interpret MRI scans. We have also talked about some of the serious pathologies, paying particular attention to those red flags that point towards a serious pathology. And we've considered some of the more benign and thankfully more common pathologies. And then finally looked at some of the yellow flags that determine a poor prognosis with these benign pathologies. So that's it for this podcast. Many thanks to Nisreen Hathiari for all her hard work in preparing this podcast and see you again soon.